personal battle. The Arizona Republican has remained a vocal critic of President Trump. He's criticized the president this week for his decision to cut a deal with Democrats on the debt ceiling and, and other matters. He called the president's decision to end protection for undocumented immigrants brought to America as children, the, quote, wrong approach to immigration policy. We have a lot of issues to discuss for an exclusive, in this exclusive interview with Republican Senator of Arizona, John McCain. Senator, it's so good to see you. Thank you, Jake. It's good to be back with you. I was just recollecting we have a 17-year... 18. 18 year 18 year adversarial relationship <laughs> <laughs> um, before I get to the issues I know you want to talk about I have to ask what everybody out there mm -hmm. is wondering mm -hmm. how is your health where are you on treatment and prognosis mm -hmm. uh, fine uh, the prognosis is pretty good it, look this is a very vicious uh, form of cancer that I'm facing but all the result, results so far are excellent um, everything's fine I have just uh, more energy than ever and uh, uh, we're doing the defense bill on the floor of the Senate tomorrow, which will take all week, uh, which is very important. And uh, so I'm just fine. But the fact is, you know, I'm in, facing a challenge, but I've faced other challenges. Uh, and I'm very confident about uh, getting through this one as well. How um, how's your family taken it? Cindy well, and Jack and Jimmy and Bridget well, and Megan? Well, you know, it's tough. And uh, we've tried to include them in when we have uh, conference calls with the doctors and by the way Mayo Clinic and they're paying me nothing for this is is excellent NIH has been really good and uh, so I'm getting the best treatment that anybody could get and I'm very happy I'm very happy with my life I'm very happy with what I've been able to do and there's two ways of looking at these things and one of them is to celebrate I am able to celebrate a wonderful life and I will be grateful for additional time that I have um, we were talking about old memories I covered the Straight Talk Express your campaign in 2000 I have a very vivid memory one time we're flying on your airplane during that 2000 presidential race and you remember that plane was a bucket of bolts <laughs> that was an awful plane It was on the cheap <laughs> and uh, we uh, we were going through turbulence. It was bad turbulence. Mm -hmm. People on the plane were scared. I was scared. You were standing in the aisle holding a glass of vodka, I think. Uh, and you were saying, they can't kill me in a plane. I can't be killed in a plane, because obviously you'd survived a number of plane crashes as a, as a Navy pilot. Does this face-off with mortality feel different than previous ones you have faced? The other ones, I had much more control, obviously. I, I was flying the airplane, you know, uh, although the melanoma was similar to this. But um, it's, it's, it's similar in that the challenges are very significant, obviously. But everything so far has gone very, very well. And I'm very grateful. And I've had no side effects, no nothing except, an in, I have, frankly, an increased level of energy. And I want to thank the doctors and the nurses and the attendants and all of those who inflicted so much pain on me. I, I didn't know I had any blood left, but I'd like to thank them for their wonderful care. They're La wonderful people. Last question on health, and then yep, we'll move on sure. to issues, and that is, you went through chemo and radiation mm -hmm. to fight this cancer. When do you find out if it worked? Uh, on Monday, we will take an MRI, but so far, all indications are, are very good. But again, I'm not trying to paint this as a, as a rosy picture. This is a very virulent form of cancer. It has to be fought against. We have new technologies, which I won't bother you with the, uh, with the details of, that make uh, chances much better. But Jake, you know, every life has to end one way or another. I, I think it was a playwright, uh, uh, I think, uh, I'll, tell you, I'll think of his name in a minute, he said, I always knew that no one could live forever, but I thought there might be one exception. <laughs> <laughs> that reminds me so that's you gotta, a, you gotta yeah. have joy, joy. Listen, those joyful memories of the, of the campaign in 2000 are some of the most enjoyable times of my life. We were the underdogs, we were fighting our way up, we, Went to Sedona, you remember? I mean, everything was so magic about that campaign. And I'm very grateful for having the opportunity. Remember, I'm the guy that stood fifth from the bottom of his class at the Naval Academy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's talk to you about issues, because I know you want to. You've been urging President Trump yeah. uh, to work in a more bipartisan manner. This week he did that. He, uh, he reached out to Chuck Schumer and Leader Pelosi to cut a deal to increase the debt ceiling, finance the government, and fund hurricane relief. Uh, and yet you voted against it. You were one of 17 Republican senators to vote against, uh, vote against the package. 
Why vote against this foray into bipartisanship? Well, in, in all due respect, uh, this was not an exercise in bipartisanship. The Republican leaders, uh, Ryan and McConnell, were surprised to, to hear that he had cut this deal with Chuck and Nancy. And the way you do deals is you sit down together, you have good staff with you, and you go with proposals back and forth. The proposal that the president accepted, the Speaker of the House, had just categorically react, rejected. So that's not the way we need to do business. And the other aspect of this, if I might, is that the agreement that they made is basically devastating to national defense. Jake, we have had a hundred, uh, we've had eight, 185 service members have lost their lives in non-combat accidents over the last three years. We've lost only 44 were killed in combat. And that's because our leadership, military and others have told us that our military capabilities and readiness is declining. I, you know, I'm not often that I like to to make, uh, uh, to give quotes, but I think that it's important to recognize that the, um, uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff said that if we continue on this road, we've lost our advantage over our potential adversaries. Not to mention putting the lives of these brave men and women at risk because we're not giving them the training, the equipment, and the capabilities they need. That's unconscionable. And this agreement basically freezes last year's funding in place, which is a cut of $52 billion. Now, this is a president that, that campaigned and said, I'm going to rebuild the military. We're going to increase that. Well, that, that's, that's not something I'm, that I can stand for. I believe my first obligation as chairman of the Armed Services Committee is to make sure the men and women who are serving in our military have everything they need. Under this agreement, they not only don't have everything they need, their lives are in greater danger. We can't do that to them. Let's talk about this um, issue of, of re readiness because, as you noted, uh, four Navy ships collided with other vessels this year. It's cost 17 sailors their lives. You're a Navy yep. man. Yep. One of the ships that crashed, obviously, the USS John S. McCain, is a destroyer. I believe it's named after your father and your grandfather. Yes. Yes. Um, your John I'm S. Glad McCain you III. That up. I've had so well, people think that the ship's hey, named after you. Ship. Usually, <laughs> yeah. No, it's uh, but but you are yeah. John S. McCain the third. Yep. Why is this happening? It's happened because we have not funded. Whenever you cut defense, the first thing that goes is the ones that are easy to cut: training, readiness, maintenance. Those things. They just you know, they, if you cancel a ship, then you alienate a certain amount of people who are sponsors of that project. So the first thing that goes is readiness and training. And readiness and training has gone down and down and down. So that they, and they are deploying with fewer, let's talk about the Navy, with fewer ships at greater uh, rapidity of, of exercising, which then cuts down on training, cuts down on readiness, et cetera. And the answer is inevitable. And by the way, our service chiefs have been warning about yeah. us about this for several years. This is the product of the last eight years, not the product of this year. So um, I appreciate the president's uh, commitment, but we have got to spend more money on defense giving we're in the most turbulent world that we've been in the last 70 years. I don't want to make a lecture, but at the end of World War II, we designed a new world order, the longest period of peace and prosperity in history. That is now unraveling, and I don't have to tell you all the places in the world where it's unraveling. This requires a stronger national defense, a stronger military. I mean, look at the crisis we're facing in North Korea. This is really serious. Let's talk about North Korea. Okay. There are experts who say that the only real answer is to, for this, this country and the world to be able to try to live with a nuclear North Korea. What do you think? I don't think so. I think that uh, Kim Jong-un is not rational. Uh, I know that he's rational in to the degree that he wants to confront the United States of America. But I think more importantly, if you allow him to have nuclear weapons and South Korea, Japan and others who are under our, quote, nuclear umbrella, don't. I think that's uh, that's out of balance. But how do, More, you prevent, how do you prevent him from, from doing it? One is China. Obviously, China can put the brakes on Kim Jong-un. So far, they have not. In fact, in some ways, they've increased their assistance. But the other is to make it clear that we, re we really have two choices. One, accept that 
or uh, have a nuclearized uh, region. The third option is uh, that we've got to do along with it is missile defense, capabilities to, to defend Korea. In other words, make sure that Kim Jong-un knows that if he acts in an aggressive fashion, the price will be extinction. And uh, we, we need to have a better relationship with Japan and Korea. By the way, the, the, the uh, Korean defense minister just a few days ago called for nuclear weapons to be redeployed. We had them there once in South Korea. You think that the U.S. should do that? I, I think it ought to be seriously considered. But I also think that we got to tell the Chinese, it'll hurt the United States if we lose some trade with you. But I'm telling you now, it's going to have, something is going to have to change because we, otherwise we're presented with two unacceptable options. You've been, uh, you've been very critical of the president when it comes to his moves on uh, DACA, the Obama era program that provided um, some temporary protections mm. for undocumented immigrants brought here as children through no fault of their own. You said that the president's decision to end DACA is an unacceptable reversal of promises made. Do you think that Congress should codify DACA? And do you think there should be a path to citizenship for the so-called dreamers? I think yes and yes. But I, do, but I think it ought to be done in a comprehensive fashion. You know, a few years ago, we passed through the Senate with a vote of 68 votes, comprehensive immigration reform. That STEM, uh, science, technology, and engineering people, guest workers, uh, a, a number of other provisions, which is, makes it comprehensive, border security, et cetera. We need to do that and, so that and make that part of it, the dreamers part of it. Second of all, it is not conscionable to tell young people who came here as children that they have to go back to a country that they don't know. And by the way, there's 900 of these dreamers that are serving in uniform in the United States military. Now, are we going to go to a young man or woman serving in Afghanistan or Iraq today and say, hey, by the way, you're a dreamer. Get back to fill in the blank. We're not going to do that to these young men and women who are serving in uniform. But we need a comprehensive um, uh, plan. We needed to go through Congress, which is what DACA did not, as you know. Right. And we did it once in the Senate. We can do it again in a bipartisan fashion. And we're going to talk about how partisanship is now seems to be dominating the environment in Washington to the detriment of the American people. The Hurricane Irma, uh, as it hits Florida, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the fact that many experts say that the storm is more intense because of climate change. Uh, back in 2012, when Hurricane Sandy uh, and then Superstorm Sandy hit the East Coast. Your daughter, Megan McCain, tweeted, so are we still going to go with climate change not being real, fellow Republicans? Um, the Republican Party, uh, as you know, uh, generally speaking, uh, acts as if climate change is not real. There are exceptions, you, your daughter, mm -hmm. Megan, mm -hmm. the Republican mayor of Miami. Mm -hmm. um, but, but generally speaking, the president, the governor of Florida, et cetera, uh, act as if it's not real, even though the overwhelming science, scientific consensus is that it, it's real and it's man-made. Why? I don't know, because I can't divine their motives, but I know this, that uh, there is things happening with the climate in, in the world that is unprecedented. Second of all, we need to have, in my view, nuclear power as part of the answer. It's the cleanest, cheapest, in many ways, source of power. My friends in the environmental community refuse to make that part of the equation. I'm not saying it is the equation, but I'm saying it's got to be part of it because they're basically anti-nuclear. Now, I spun off a little bit there, but we have to understand that the climate may be changing and we can take common sense measures which will not harm the American people in our economy. In fact, solar and other technologies make it cheaper for energy for many of the American people, including a state like mine where we have lots of sunshine. So uh, I think it's time for us to sit down again. All of these problems that you and I are discussing and want to discuss require what our founding fathers wanted us to do in, in, the, in the issue, of course, of, of, uh, of, the, uh, cl of, the, of health care. Why didn't we have hearings, have amendments, have debate, bring a bill to the floor, have amendments, have debate, and then come up with a product. Listen, we just passed through 
the Senate Armed Services Committee a bill to defend this nation. Vote was 27 to 0. Okay? Why? Because it was done in a bipartisan way. It was done in a bipartisan fashion. We fought and we argued and we're still mad at each other. But we came up with a bill that all of us could support. And I guarantee you, except for a couple of outliers, we will get this done and to the president's desk. That's what the American people want us to do. The American people now see Gorsuch and some regulations. That's what they see with nine months of, of uh, undivided Republican majorities. That's not good. Last question for you, and I hope this is not our last interview. I know a lot of people want to interview you, and uh, I appreciate that. A lot of people wanted to be the last. <laughs> <laughs> I but it's my last, my last question for you, and, and I hope I don't run this clip for another 50 years. But how do you want the American people to remember you? Uh, he served his country, and not always right. Made a lot of mistakes, made a lot of errors, but served his country, and I hope we could add honorably. I think that we can say honorably. Senator John McCain, it's always great to have you here. Do not be a stranger. There's a seat for you anytime you want. Thanks. Dave. It's great to see you. Thank say you. hi to Cindy and everybody else. Thank you. Coming up next, the very latest on Hurricane Irma making landfall. Oh, we're going to go, I'm sorry, we're going to go to Kyung La right now. She's in uh, Miami Beach. Uh, Kyung La, what are you experiencing right now? Kyung, can you hear me? confusing out here, Jake. It's, it's, it's a little confusing out here, Jake. You'll have to forgive me uh, because what we're having out here is a hurricane. I mean, we're starting to see conditions uh, worsen pretty much the last time that I was with you. It, it didn't feel quite as bad as this. It's, it certainly feels a little bit worse now. It's a little bit harder to stand. Um, it's hard to gauge what's happening with the trees because until they snap, we just don't know. What we have seen break off our street signs. Uh, we have not seen any major flooding here. And we do want to stress that if you are in Miami Beach, you are on your own. There is no more police and fire out here to help you, Jake. All right. Thank you so much, Kyung. As always, stay safe. We're going to turn now to CNN meteorologist Allison Chinchar. She's in the CNN Weather Center. And Allison, where's the storm now? Where's it headed? All right, so it's officially made landfall over the Keys. It did so at 9:10 this morning. Now it's going back out over open water and very warm water, I should mention. So we don't expect this storm to really change much in the next couple of hours. Right now, still a Category 4 storm, 130 mile per hour winds. You can see some of those incredibly heavy rain bands, not just around Key West, but also the outer bands, Fort Pierce, Fort Lauderdale, even Fort Myers starting to pick up in some of those heavier bands of rain. Current winds. Notice Key West. Nothing. That's because the station is broken. It stopped reporting after it likely took an incredibly high wind gust. Elsewhere, though, we're seeing 40, 45, 50, even 60 mile per hour wind gusts, and those are going to increase because the track is expected to take it off the West Coast, heading towards Naples, Fort Myers, eventually into Tampa. Now, the one thing you will notice is we do expect it to eventually weaken by the time it gets to Tampa. So it's a slow weakening. However, once it gets to the panhandle, it's going to encounter some shear. And that is going to rip that storm apart very quickly. So it goes from a three down to a one, down to a tropical depression incredibly fast. The big story we've been talking to you about is the storm surge. Right now, the biggest storm surge is on the east coast side of Florida. All of that water is being pushed in from the strong winds. On the west coast side, it's entirely the opposite. The water is actually retreating. It's being pushed back out. You do not want to be on the beach when that water comes back. It comes back in fast and furious, and it can turn into a deadly situation incredibly fast. And it is going to come back. As that storm makes its way north, uh, crossing over the main peninsula, that water will come back in. And that, Jake, is when we're going to start to see some of the biggest storm surges for the West Coast region of Florida. And, and what's going to happen? Uh, we have, uh, obviously, a lot of individuals, including our own uh, Kyung La in Miami Beach right now. What's going to happen as the storm hits Florida to the areas of Miami and Miami Beach.
Right, so she, the, the currents and conditions that she is dealing with now are going to sustain that way for several hours before she finally starts to see conditions uh, get a little bit better in Miami. And that's going to be for most people in southeast Florida. It's going to remain bad for hours, and then it will finally begin to let up. Now, the rain bands will be off and on. You'll go from light showers to torrential downpours. But in terms of the winds, those are going to remain hurricane force gusts for quite some time. The West Coast side, you're going to start to see the conditions uh, deteriorate rapidly over the coming hours, especially the folks in Tampa. All right, Allison, thank you so much. And we're going to go back to CNN's Kim La. She's uh, in Miami Beach. Uh, and, and Kim, we're told the conditions where you are are going to get worse. Um, have you, are you able to detect that just on the ground? Kim La, I'm not sure if you can hear me. Let's go back to Allison uh, Chinchar. So, um, Allison, in the, in the Severe Weather Center, uh, the storm uh, it has made landfall, obviously, in Key West. It did so at 910 this morning, you said, uh, and it's making itself uh, up, the, up the west coast of Florida. There are a lot of individuals who fled uh, southern Florida uh, for places upstate uh, that are now right in the eye of the storm. And Tampa being one of them. And, and unfortunately, what we've seen in the short term, the last couple of hours, is a shift in the track. Uh, around Tampa, it's only a 14-mile difference. It's, it no longer is expected to go right through downtown Tampa, but just about 14 miles west. And Jake, under normal circumstances, you would think that would be a good thing. Great. The main center is not going to go over downtown, but further west. The problem with that is it actually allows more of the storm surge to pile into Tampa Bay. So in theory, yes, your winds may not be as strong as that center of circulation pushes further to the west, but it increases your chances for the storm surge and potentially the height of said storm surge as well. All right, we're going to go now uh, to Key Largo, Florida, where we find CNN's uh, Bill Weir. Um, Bill, you're in the upper keys. Uh, the, the hurricane made landfall uh, on the lower keys at 9, 10 a.m. Uh, describe for us the conditions you're experiencing. It's, a, it's really a, a dramatic shift as the wind starts to whip around now. Actually, that the uh, Irma came ashore at the exact spot we did the last evacuation uh, live shot on, I guess, Friday night as people were really starting to, to, to head north on US-1 after so many admonitions uh, from first responders and the authorities now. We actually had to move our position to the under end of this carport, uh, so now we're facing uh, Biscayne Bay, and this is where the, the, the sloppy, dirty side of the storm, as you talk about, will start to pick up. And, and as an extra menace, we have a sign here that says, caution, crocodiles in the area, a reminder of the biodiversity in this part of Florida. Uh, you know, you could, I guess, make a joke about a crocnado, uh, but if, if that is the case, it would not be a threat. It would be Obviously, wildlife is as much risk here as, as human life, but we're checking in with our contacts that we've made over the last couple of days around. We're hearing from people on the other side, on the Atlantic side of, of Key Largo, who are riding it out. They're losing tiki huts. They're seeing sheets of plywood blow around. No major boat damage. If you remember back to Hurricane Andrew, the way those boats were stacked like cordwood, uh, nobody has seen that yet at this particular, thank goodness. But the big concern is, is what these big 100, 110 mile an hour winds will do to the infrastructure in this part of the Keys. The, uh, the, uh, tran the o ocean railroad that they built in the, back in the 30s was taken out by a hurricane. People worry that if one of those bridges goes, it will cut off the Keys from the mainland for the unforeseeable future. They do have a desalination plant. They do have a, a power generation station that can give them maybe 60% of their peak power uh, to tie them over to get things back uh, back normal. But it is really, been, mm -hmm. I think this is my eighth hurricane. I'm hardly a, a, a seasoned meteorology. We, we did Katrina together. I uh, did Ike and Gustav. This is the most violent I've ever seen, Jake. Stay safe, Bill. We will. Joining us on the phone is Senator uh, Marco Rubio. He's a, a Republican uh, of Florida. Um, Senator Rubio? Joining us on the phone right now from his home in Miami is Senator Marco Rubio, Republican of Florida. Uh, Senator, um, thanks so much for joining us. Hurricane Irma's destructive eyewall hit the Florida Keys uh, just this morning. Do you have any sense of how bad it is down there in the Keys? 
Well, I don't think anyone does at this point because obviously there's not a lot of people there. Thankfully, they left. The ones that are, uh, we're not in communication with. But we can just imagine. If you've ever been to the Keys, these are very narrow uh, chain of islands basically built on coral rock and, um, and, and coral reefs. And, and, um, and it's not, it's not going to be good, which is why we needed to get people out of there. We're deeply concerned about the storm is, is intensifying. The waters are over 90 degrees in, in the Caribbean basin, the, the Florida Straits, uh, in that Gulf uh, stream and uh, region. So we're concerned about it intensifying. As it heads into southwest Florida, Naples, Fort Myers, Sarasota, Tampa Bay, I mean, that has always been our biggest fear, is a massive storm headed into that region, pushing all that water in there, plus the wind. Um, we're deeply concerned about that. So. Frankly, everybody in Florida needs to be taking precautions. The worst is yet to come for south and southeast Florida, which is still facing uh, bad storms. We haven't had power in my house here since 2 in the morning and so forth. But southwest Florida, this is a very disturbing uh, chain of events here, and we just pray for the best, and hopefully people have heeded the warnings and are hunkered down in a safe place. You are in your home in Miami. Are, are you safe? Why did you decide to ride out the storm uh, in your home? Yeah. Well, first, I'm not in a flood zone. I'm not in a far, not on the coast. Uh, I, my home was built in 2005, so my roof is built to withstand a Category 3 storm, on my, in which we won't get the effects of in Miami, and my and my roof can withstand that as well. So we have shutters on the window and so forth. Now, um, a lot of people left South Florida, and some of them drove to Tampa and Orlando, and now they find themselves kind of in the eye of this thing or certainly facing this thing down. And so that's one of the calculations we made. At this point, hopefully, those people who have left South Florida and have moved into those other communities in the state, this is not a time for them to get on the road and try to head back. This is a time for them to have confidence, hopefully, in where they are and just stay in place and ride it out. But, um, you know, it was one of those storms where it wasn't easy to just move your family. There really wasn't anywhere in Florida that I could point to and say, if you go there, you're not going to see the storm. It's going to cover all of Florida. I know people that went to Georgia that are now figuring out how to get out of Georgia because it's headed in that direction. Where, where are your wife and children? They're here. Um, I think the, the kids are still up there sleeping. You know, when you put shutters on your home, it's darker than ever, so it's a pretty good sleep, actually. It gets dark inside a house, so uh, hopefully they'll... Uh, but we're going to be in this, you know, till tomorrow morning. I mean, uh, that's the threat in South Florida, but uh, it's just beginning for the rest of the state. But they're here, thankfully, and, and everyone's safe. Senator Rubio, we're praying for you, your family.